Let's get into the passage tonight. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on Genesis 48. I almost said 49. I'm jumping right ahead. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your holy word. And Lord, we don't take it lightly. We don't look at a story involving Joseph and just think, oh, it doesn't matter to us. But Lord, I pray that the, the relevancy of your word would come to bear upon our hearts and minds tonight. I pray, Lord, that we would come to know you more. Lord, how often are you misunderstood? How often do we misinterpret the events and actions of our life and we think, Lord, that you did something wrong? And how we need to be willing to see things in truth and accept that we might be viewing our situation or the situation of somebody else in a wrong light. So help us, Lord, to see with clarity. Help us to see with your truth and help us to receive it tonight. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's interesting, the last song that Stephanie and Gracie sang, it was talking about how he calls us as his own. We didn't talk about song choices tonight. That was something Stephanie came up with and prayed about. Uh, but this passage in Genesis 48 is about that. That Jacob, the patriarch of the whole family at this time, remember, you might get sick of my review a little bit. Um, I'm not that concerned if you like it or not. Because the reality is this. I need it as much as you do. And everything builds off of the previous weeks. And so to accurately communicate what's going on, I have to kind of bring you up to speed again. Uh, what's worse, if I jump right into it, and 10 minutes later you're like, oh, that's who Jacob is. Now I, now I remember again, right? So hopefully I'm alleviating some of that confusion. But the reality is, is Genesis is looking at how the children of Israel came into slavery in Egypt how it all began, how God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans to make a nation that God would place his name upon, his covenantal adoptive love upon them, and he would love them uniquely as his own. He chose them out of the world to be his people, which is a picture of what God intended to do in the new covenant through Christ that he would call pagans like you and I out of the world into his heavenly kingdom to be his adopted children, that he would choose us as his own, that he would place his unique love upon us as our father and we his children. And so that's why the Old Testament is completely informing us about the new covenant reality we live in. So Abraham comes out, God promises to him the land of Canaan. Then you have the promised child Isaac finally comes to the scene in Abraham and Sarah's old age. And then Isaac and Rebecca have twins. She was another barren woman. Isn't that interesting? Sarah was barren into her old age. Rebecca was barren. Isaac prayed for her and God gave her the ability to conceive. She had Jacob and Esau. Jacob the younger was chosen over Esau. So now you have Jacob and he now has 12 sons which we know Joseph becomes the focus of the 12 sons of Israel because Joseph is the savior figure who's going to point us to Jesus, how he's going to lead us out of slavery into freedom. Joseph is the one who's going to protect and provide for all the needs of God's chosen family. Through his service to the Lord in a pagan environment, God saves his whole family who had forsaken him. Doesn't Jesus save his family who has forsaken him? We all have forsaken the Lord. And uh, I'm going to give you a little preview because I had a little thought and I'm going to run with it. This Sunday, pastors don't always tell you what they're going to preach on Sunday because they're afraid if it's a difficult topic, you're not going to show up. Let me tell you, it's probably the most difficult topic this Sunday. And if you don't show up, I know who you are. Because I can see your faces. What do you think the most difficult topic for people to hear is? Ooh, no, that's a good one. That's number two. What's that? Anybody? Hmm? Anybody? Nobody, everybody's scared. They're all scared. Forgiveness. 
Hmm. How do we forgive? You better show up. (laughs) But here's the reality. We have to understand our sinfulness and how we have wronged God and how He has forgiven us in order for us to be able to forgive others. We don't think we've sinned against God very much. We don't really understand what we've done and how grave of sins we've committed. And so because we don't think we've been forgiven much, we don't have the ability to forgive another person like us. There's a lot more to talk about on that. But here you have Joseph being that savior figure and his family rejected him, left him for dead. Joseph forgave them, did he not? Tremendously, graciously. Not immediately though, right? It took some time and some testing. So that's an interesting thing I might pull in this Sunday. But here you have Joseph now. He's reconciled with his family. And the point we made in the previous week was that Jacob was now called by God to let go of something promised in order to receive something else promised. He couldn't have both. He wanted to be reconciled with his son Joseph, but he had to let go with the land promise in order to have his son promise. Would you not give up anything for your child? Or do you need to really hold on to your career or this or that and sacrifice your child on the altar? Or wouldn't it be better to sacrifice your career or your pursuit or your hobby so that you might be reconciled with your child? Too many people choose this route. They sacrifice the child, their children on the altar of their ambitions. At the end of the day, it's not going to be your career that's at your bedside telling you that it, loved, it loves you and it thanks you for all your years of sacrifice and service. It's going to be your children that you're going to care about in that moment, not your 401k. I'm not saying be irresponsible and be lazy. But I'm saying don't let your ambitions squash your family ministry sometimes we have to not succeed as much in a certain field so we can succeed more in another wouldn't you rather succeed in your family above all things or would you rather have your career you know well oftentimes what i see is those who are willing to put their family first actually end up succeeding far more than what they expected in their work life because they were willing to put what matters most first. And uh, the Christian life is all about priorities. It's what are we putting first? Is it the Lord and His kingdom? Or is it our need to be significant? Our need to be successful? Our need to look a certain way in the eyes of another person or people? Or is it what God wants for us? We have to be willing to do things God's way to get His blessing Jacob lets go of the land of Canaan that God promised to his dad and his granddad. Can you imagine feeling like a failure? Jacob was probably like, God promised this land to my grandfather, gave it to my father, now gave it to me, and I'm letting it all go. I had to, at 21 years old, after marrying my bride and being married for a whopping month and a half, My dad passed away of Lou Gehrig's disease. I took over his uh, pool company, which was making, uh, doing plumbing electrical for custom swimming pools. And my mom and I tried to run it with the pre-existing crew and team that we had. And I had to make the decision to close down my dad's company. At 21 years old, I had to close down what he had worked 25 years for. And it was because of pre-existing problems and bad decisions that were there. And my mom and I had to do that. And I had to communicate to these guys, some of them who had worked with my dad from the beginning, that you no longer were going to have a job. You think they liked me very much? Not very much. That was a tough lesson. And I had to let go of what my dad had built. And I imagine that's how Jacob felt. But he knew that he couldn't hold on to what his dad and granddad had built and still reconcile with 
Joseph. And he would have died and the whole family would have died had they held on too long. So he, because of God's encouragement, was willing to let it go. God said, do not fear, I'll be with you into Egypt and out of Egypt. And so then last week we see the report that Joseph goes to Pharaoh and he says this in 47 verse 1, my father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. That is the main point of what happened in all of 47, of what we covered last week. There is no greater point to be spoken about, but the fact that Jacob and his whole family, 70 people, finally arrived there in Egypt. Now you remember it started with Abraham, one man, and now by the time of Isaac, now Jacob, it's grown to 70 there's two generations time from one person to 70. That's pretty good growth. And then in 400 years time, it goes from 70 to like 2.1 million. That's some good growth. So what I see that in God's kingdom, things are meant to grow, right? Do you think that God desires for his kingdom to grow today? Yep. Does it mean every church needs to be a mega church or it's a failure? No. Listen, there's nothing wrong with a small church and there's nothing wrong with a big church. What matters is, are they doing church the way God intended them to? Are they ministering to his people? Are they staying true to the gospel or are they watering it down? Because you've got big churches that do a great job with the gospel and big churches that do a bad job. You have the same with small churches. But what I see is that our church here in Norco is meant to continue to grow deeper in the Lord and grow deeper together. And God will add to his number here as we're reaching out and bringing in people through the true, straightforward gospel. God wants things to grow. God wanted Abraham and his family to grow for there to be more children in his family. And sometimes there's a small church mentality. And um, one of our members and I were talking about it today. See, you know, some people in a smaller church have a real problem with churches growing. And that's how it was at a previous church where I was at. They didn't want it to get any bigger than it was really. And it's like, well, wait a minute. That's like a child in your family. They've got a, it's an only child scenario. And the parents are like, hey, guess what? We're going to have another baby. They're like, no, I want mom and dad all to myself. And yet that child comes, then all of a sudden it's like, wow, I didn't know the family dynamic could be so different and great with the addition of one. See, Jen and I didn't get that like one child at a time scenario. Um, we had one for a whopping like three months and then Haven. So now we've got two. And then we went from two to five overnight. You know, it wasn't like, oh, let's just add a third and then a little time and then a four and then a five. It was, you get one, but don't get comfortable. Here's two and then move back to California across country. And then before you know it, oh, here's two, five. You know, it's like we went from two to five overnight and that was quite a shock. But our family was way better for it. And uh, God's kingdom is better for it when people come in and they're growing and they're getting involved and they're getting plugged in. And that's what should be happening. And well, that is what's happening here. And so the family of Jacob's growing, just as the family of God today is growing. They arrive in Egypt. Jacob blesses Pharaoh. And now we come to 48 verse 1. So why don't you stand with me in honor of God's word and we'll read it. And there's a high emphasis on adoption tonight. And you'll see why. Obviously a topic I, I love very much. Um, so you might even get some personal stories out of me. We'll see. Uh, Genesis 48. After this, um, actually, I want to read the end of 47, verse 29, uh, because it, it ties into 48. Just so you know, the chapter divisions in the Bible are not what the original manuscripts had. They just flowed together. They didn't have these artificial divisions. There was no Genesis number 48 in the original text. It was created later. So when you're in a group like this, somebody go turn to Genesis 48 and we can all go to that page. But actually all of this is meant to be read together. 
So this is an artificial division between 47 and 48. And you'll see why. When the time drew near that Israel must die, so Jacob or Israel is about to die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh or inner leg and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying places. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. After this, Joseph was told, behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, notice the order right now. Manasseh comes first and then Ephraim. Your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength, sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. There's that multiplication. And I will make of you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. Notice the order shifted. Ephraim was mentioned first and then Manasseh. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way. When there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face and behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands. For Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them, let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people and he shall also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day saying, by you, Israel will pronounce blessing saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. Then he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Ammonites with my sword and with my bow. You can be seated. So if you are confused, don't worry about it. We'll walk you through it a little bit. There's a natural division here in the paragraphs. The first section is verses one to seven. Jacob reveals his intent to adopt Joseph's two sons. So Joseph marries an Egyptian woman. He's second in command in Egypt. And it was a wife that Pharaoh gave to him. He loved his wife. He had two sons with her, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh is the firstborn. Ephraim is the second. By way of inheritance, things in the ancient world are different than today. Today, many parents try to divide up all their possessions and their wealth evenly among the children. Not always. 
most of the time. That's kind of how they try to do it as best they can. Does it work? Most of the time, there's a fight over the inheritance. It's awful. A parent dies, and then the siblings fight, they divide, and they're not on talking terms anymore. Is that really what mom and dad wanted? No, but it happens all the time. It's awful, and I, I hate it when I hear about it. But that's what happens oftentimes. But in the ancient world, it's, hey, the firstborn gets it all. There's no argument. It's what it was expected. It's the way things are done. Firstborn gets everything. So now we have a situation where Jacob is going to bless one of the sons and he's going to bless the younger, not the older. Which is interesting because Isaac's two sons, Jacob and Esau, were twins, right? Esau technically came out first, but Jacob was holding on to his heel, right? That's why he was named Jacob or heel catcher. He was one who was trying to take the inheritance. And he did. He took it. He coerced it out of his brother's hands. Birthright and inheritance. What's interesting about that is God was going to give it to Jacob anyways. Jacob screwed things up a little bit for a while. But now Jacob is seeking to honor who? The younger. Instead of the older. And uh, so, but what he's telling his son Joseph is, look, I am going to take your two sons and they're going to be mine. I'm adopting them by way of inheritance. So Jacob, interestingly enough, the land of Canaan is not going to all go to Reuben the oldest. It's going to be divided up amongst the 12, right? But at the end, we hear that he has a little mountain slope that he's left to Joseph, right? And his kids, like a little ski resort on the side um, near, you know, near the Dead Sea. I don't know. But he, he was reserved a mountain slope that he himself took with his own sword and bow. He fought for it. He earned it. And he's going to give it just to Joseph and his sons. But here's the question I want to ask you. How many tribes are there in Israel? Twelve. Okay. So if you go through the list... And you see the tribes mentioned. Where's the tribe of Joseph? But he's one of the 12. So if Jacob or Israel takes the two sons to be his own, we know there's tribes Ephraim and Manasseh. You take those two and you add them to how many other tribes? There's 12. So you have 11 and Joseph. Ephraim and Manasseh. So imagine this is 11. I don't have 11 fingers. <laughs> so 11 over here. You had one that's now two. 11 plus two is what? Technically, there's 13. But in regards to biblical inheritance and representation, there's 12. So you always hear the 12 tribes of Israel. It's not, it's technically 12 in one way, but not in another. That's why it's super confusing. So Ephraim and Manasseh are adopted by Jacob. But here's what's cool about it. Those two sons were born in Egypt. Right? Jacob's other 12 were born in the land of Canaan, in the land of promise. So you have outsiders being adopted in where they don't belong. We're outside of the covenant of God. We're not naturally born His children. We've been orphaned by our own sin, and God says you were born in a pagan, wicked land, and yet I have chosen to love you, and I'm going to make you my own. That's why Stephanie's song choice was so great tonight, about I call you as my own. Because that is the heart of God that he calls those who are not his to be his. That's why adoption is the gospel in the flesh. It's that my five kids are not biologically from my body and my wife's body. And yet we have chosen to place our covenantal adoptive love on them before they could do good or bad. 
to say we are going to love you your whole life through. No matter what you do, you will be ours forever. How much more so has God done that for you and me? When we realize that God didn't have to choose us. And my kids one day are going to have that realization that mom and dad could have chose to have no kids, to not adopt them, to say that, you know what, it's too much. We just can't do it. And they would have been somewhere else in the world. But we chose them. That's why I love the story I heard growing up of a, a pastor who we knew. A do, he had a biological daughter and he had an adopted daughter. And as siblings do, they fought. And they were fighting one day. And the biological daughter di decided to really hit below the belt. And she goes, well, I'm mom and dad's real kid. They adopted you. And she goes, yeah, mom. And, and the adopted daughter goes, yeah, mom and dad were stuck with you. They chose me. <laughs> right? It's like mom and dad had no choice with you, but they actually chose me. See, that girl understood what it meant to be adopted, to be chosen. And her parents gave her strong confidence in that. Just even today, that silly st singing show we were watching, there was a, a, a man who, he was raised... Um, his dad was a pastor, and, uh, and his mom, they found out he could sing, and they took him to voice lessons and recitals all growing up, and he had record producers pursuing him. Uh, things looked really good for this young man, and then out of the blue, this lady calls and says, I'm your real mother. Talk to your parents, and they'll tell you everything about it. She didn't talk to the adopted mom and dad. She just called out of the blue and totally shipwrecked the guy's whole life. He didn't know he was adopted. See, that's why our kids from the earliest days, we haven't hidden anything from them because we, there's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. But back then, there was shame associated with adoption. Uh, my aunt didn't find out um, until... She was 18, that her biological father died in World War II, and her mother remarried another soldier from World War II, which is my grandfather and my dad's dad, and she didn't know that she was a half-sibling with my dad. You know who broke the news to her? My dad. He found paperwork. And he was probably about 14, 15, and he shows it to his 18-year-old sister, and it rocked her because there was all this fear that don't let them know they're adopted. And I think sometimes in Christ, in the church, we don't want to talk about our adoption. We want to act like we, we belong, that we've earned it. We have a right to the promises of God. We don't have a right to any of it. God could have chosen to leave you in your sins, to not send His Holy Spirit to open your eyes and soften your heart and allow you to die in that state and be punished for all the evil you've ever done. You're like, that's not fair. It actually is the definition of fair. Giving somebody what they deserve. But what God has done is show us grace and give us what we don't deserve. And so if you are in Christ and you believe in him, there's an aspect of God, thank you that you didn't leave me in the mess that I made for myself. But you saved me in the time that you saw fit. And God, I am thankful for what you've done in my life. And that's why I hope my kids have that kind of thankfulness towards Jen and I. And we're flawed like any parent. We have our moments. But I hope they're raised and they understand, you know what? My mom and dad chose to love me and bring me in. To adopt me when they didn't have to. They could have left me in foster care. They could have left me where I was. 
And yet God, through his grace, laid it upon my mom and dad's heart to take me and make me their own. And man, when we adopted our kids, especially when, when we, with Joey and Haven, we didn't get to go before the judge. We were moving from Virginia. It was all done through correspondence, basically. So when we were adopting the three boys, we wanted that court hearing. And it was, it was pretty amazing because of the wording. And it, this was the judge who, because of his decision, they were taken away at one point. And we thought we'd never see him again because he decided to try to reunify with birth mom again for like the third time. And uh, we had had the boys for a year and then we had to say goodbye. And a lot of trauma and, and pain that they deal with now was from that time apart. But that same judge is the one who presided over the adoption. And he used this word and he said, Basically, it was super formal, and I wish I could remember all the words, but he said, will you love and treat Lucas Wozniak, Isaac Wozniak, Landon Wozniak with the same rights and privileges that you would give to any child naturally born to you? that they would have all the rights and benefits you would confer upon a natural born child, that you would confer upon them in the same measure. I mean, it was amazing, the wording. Jen and I were like, wow, like, you know, basically, legally, in every way, there are every dot, every T, everything is tied to us now. There's not a single thing that's left to their past, but it's all directly in connection to us. It was amazing. We lost it. We were, we were crying. And um, that was where I've shared this before. But Lucas was, I think it was four and a half at the time. He is climbing over my shoulder as I'm signing the paper going, Dad, is that for me? Is that for me? Is that, is that, is that for me? And we should be that way with the Lord. Like, is that, is that relationship, is that inheritance for me? Like, Jesus, did you do that for me? And that's what we should see in it. And here, Jacob, this elderly man, is a picture of Christ going, I am going to adopt your kids, Joseph. They're going to be mine. All the inheritance I would give to you, I am giving to them. And that is how God the Father has chosen to adopt us in Christ. And all that God the Father would give to Jesus, He has said, I am giving to you who believe in Jesus. Man, I, I wish we on a daily basis understood the blessings we have in Christ. Because our days would be very different. The way we interact, the way things affect us or don't affect us would be so different if we really had that heavenly perspective of what we have been blessed with. And that's why in the famous passage of Ephesians 1, when it talks about how he chose in love, he predestined us to adoption in Christ, that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He starts that section with, we have been given every blessing in Christ. And what is that blessing he starts with? Being chosen and predestined to adoption. That's big. That's a big thing for you and I, and I hope that that hits home. But here in 1 through 7, he says, I'm going to adopt them. But then in 8 to the end, Joseph brings his sons to his dad. Remember, his dad's dying. He's on his deathbed. And Israel saw Joseph's sons, and he said, who are these? Implying that maybe he hasn't had a formal meeting with his grandkids yet. We know that his eyes are dim, so maybe he was just making sure he knew who they were. And Joseph said to his father, these are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. This concept of blessing, I'm going to admit that I have a pretty infantile understanding of biblical blessing. And it's something I want to study more because again and again and again in Scripture, you see an older person or one of authority laying their hands on somebody else and conferring on them a blessing. And it seems in God's economy, that laying on of hands and blessing is very, very significant. 
And I wonder how significant our blessing of others is. I mean, what if I laid my hands on my kids every day and like legitimately, Lord, bless them? Why not? It's within my right and privilege and authority to do so. Why not do that with the kids? Blessing others. Lovingly putting our hand on their shoulder and praying a blessing over their life. Here, Jacob blessed Pharaoh before. Now he's going to bless Ephraim and Manasseh. Verse 10, now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. He's blind as a bat. Must have been hereditary because uh, if you remember, Isaac was blind and that's how Jacob was able to deceive him by putting a bunch of goat hair on his arms and the back of his neck to impersonate his brother Esau. Is that not troubling to you? Esau, I've seen some hairy dudes. You know, I'm Italian. You know, it runs in our family. And yet, dude, okay, the hairiest guy I've ever been around was my first wrestling coach. The guy literally, he had so much upper body hair that his t-shirt stood an inch and a half off his body. And if you touched his shoulder, it would make a crinkling sound like cellophane. Because he was so hairy. And if he took his shirt off, you'd think he had a sweater underneath the shirt. (laughs) Seriously, hairiest guy I've ever met. Here, Esau would have put him to shame. He would look look like a prepubescent, you know, junior higher. Um, Esau was hairy and red to the point where thick goat hair was the only thing could fool his dad. And here, so Isaac was blind. Jacob ends up going blind. He can't see. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Israel is feeling a moment of extreme blessing himself. He thought for years, over 13 years, that he'd never see Joseph. And now he sees Joseph and Joseph's kids. This was a dream come true for Jacob. And so then Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. What does that tell us about the age of Ephraim and Manasseh? It's a little awkward if they're teenagers sitting on their dad's knee, right? I know cultures are different at different times, but I'm willing to bet they weren't teenagers sitting on dad's knee. That implies that they were little kids. So here they are, little kids, before they've either done right or wrong, um, for the most part, we see that Joseph bows him face to his, himself to the ground after taking the kids off his knees. Verse 13, Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. He knew what he was doing. He's going, okay, that's dad's right hand. So I'm going to make sure the oldest is on dad's right hand side. And that the youngest is on dad's left hand side. Because the right hand is symbolic of power and authority. And so Jacob was conferring upon one son his power, authority, blessing, and inheritance. And so Joseph has it all choreographed. And he's bringing them to his dad. And dad throws him a curveball. Dad goes, and Joseph's like, no, and he's trying to know, dad. And he grabs his hand, tries to put it, and he goes, Joseph, I know what I'm doing. And Joseph's thinking, dad's going senile. Dad forgot who these kids are. I got to kind of put them in the right direction. And he's like, no, the younger, the older is going to serve the younger. Just as it happened with Jacob and Esau, it's happening now with Ephraim and Manasseh. Both are going to be blessed, but... The name of Ephraim is even significant. Verse 14, Israel stretched out his hand, laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Ephraim means doubly fruitful, double blessing. Manasseh means one that makes to forget. Not really sure the application there. It can mean forgotten, but it all, can also mean one who makes you to forget. Um, all I know is Ephraim, that name, doubly fruitful. 
is evident in his life and God's blessing on him. But verse five or 15, and he blessed Joseph and said, so the blessing on Ephraim and Manasseh is really a blessing on Joseph, his tribe, which becomes Ephraim and Manasseh. And look at what he says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. Here's one of the early indications of God's people being sheep and God being our shepherd. Remember their occupation. They're all shepherds. They know what it's like to shepherd sheep, an animal that has to be in a flock or in a congregation that has to be led to water, has to be led to food, has to be protected from wild beasts. We as the people of God need to be led to the waters of the Spirit. We need to be led to spiritual food and drink. We have to be protected from wild beasts. We need Jesus to be our good shepherd. And Jacob says, God's been my shepherd all my life. And then he goes on and he says this, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys and in them let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So he prays blessing. He prays that they would grow every single marriage that I perform. And it might be because of my personal experience, what Jen and I have gone through with um, miscarriages and tubal pregnancies and infertility and all those things, I make it a point to pray over every single couple that I perform their marriage that God would make them fruitful, that God would bless them, that God would bless them with children. And if he decides to do it biologically or he decides to do it through the gift of adoption, doesn't matter to me. But I pray God's blessing and multiplication on them for that reason. Because I believe that the best way to grow a church is to have kids. And our church grew by one member this week. Yes, Amanda, who's not here? She had her baby. And now I'm not claiming it yet. But my preliminary reports say that her labor, which is usually 26 to 30 hours, was a lot less. Does anybody know how long her labor was? Okay, I want to know because I told her, I said, okay, I'm going to pray it's a two-hour labor. Like, boom, boom, done. Now, I'm like, that would be amazing if God decided to do it that way. All I know is it sounds like it was much quicker than what her other two pregnancies were. So that's a huge um, praise report there. But little girl is nice and healthy, right? So the church is growing, right? And that kid can't choose to leave anytime soon. So she's stuck. So that's how you continue to grow a congregation. But Joseph actually doesn't like what his dad did. It displeased him. Uh, when his, Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. He took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my go bow. He's like, hey, son, I got you covered. I'll give you one extra little piece of the inheritance I didn't give to your brothers. Apparently, Jacob didn't learn his lesson about favoritism. <laughs> right? He gave the shiny, you know, coat of many colors. Now he's given a parcel of land, a mountain slope. Uh, I mean, apparently that's how God intended it to be. But um, try to be fair and just with the, the inheritance you set aside for your kids. 
But this is all I want to say in closing. We have an amazing inheritance in Christ. And it comes through the gift of adoption. It comes through that. And adoption is the story of the gospel. Early Christians understood this. The Romans used to take the babies they didn't want. And there's babies they didn't want. They wanted a son to carry on the name. So they leave the little girl out in the field to be exposed to the elements and die. This was common practice in Roman society. It was not murder. You could go out if you didn't want the baby, put him out in your field, leave him for the night. Let wild animals get him. Let the cold kill him. Let the sun boil him. Whatever it is, leave him out to die. You know when this started to change? When Christians came on the scene. And they started to go and they would take these children and they'd adopt them to be their own kids. That was the early church. First century church. They would adopt these Roman babies that nobody wanted. Can you imagine how those kids grew up realizing, wow, you know, my mom and dad really wanted me. And they could have left me to die, but they didn't. God could have left you and I to die in our sins, but he didn't. So if you're like me, really hard on yourself, maybe your own worst critic, really good at self-condemnation, probably got a PhD in it, <laughs> you need to know that God sees you as infinitely valuable, so much so that he paid the highest price tag possible to make you his child. He gave his only begotten son so he could have you. That's how valuable you are to him. So don't sell yourself short. Don't discredit your value or worth. But know who you are in Christ and how much he loves you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the immeasurable grace that you have shown us. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much that you would send forth Jesus, Lord, to die in our place, that we might become your daughters and your sons, that we would be adopted into your family. And Lord, I pray that if anybody here has never received you as their Lord and Savior, who has never surrendered their life to you, to believe the gospel, to believe what you've done for them, may they do that in prayer now. May they ask you, Lord, to forgive them and to come into their life. May they know what eternal life feels like, that your Holy Spirit would work upon them now, draw them to be born again in eternal life, and Lord, may it resonate within their soul. May the evidence of the new life be present in them, and may they grow in faith and trust in you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.